Reese Winterborn. Well, welcome to the club, Sarah. <laughs> what a perfect hero. <laughs> he is a perfect, I mean, I think. Like, yeah. what? <laughs> Well, and I think like that's like part of me wants to be like, oh, it's so mysterious why everybody loves it. And then no, I'm like, it's no, it's not Reese at Winter all Warren. mysterious. <laughs> it is one million percent. This like I mean, he's perfect. He's perfect, yeah. I think there's gonna be a lot of things we're gonna talk about. Maybe we should introduce ourselves and just get right to it, everybody. We're marrying Winterborn this week on Faded Mates. I mean, I wish. <laughs> I wish I was married to Winterborn. I mean, no, I mean, Eric's lovely. <laughs> I mean, you know what I think about a lot? Here's how I put Reese Winterborn in his place. Look, back then he was something else, but now he's just Sears and Roebuck and nobody goes there anymore. Fine. <laughs> okay, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, that was funny. All right. That was that is the only way I will malign his name. Everything else I say will be oh nice. God. Well, I would marry Sears and Roebuck if they acted mm-hmm. this way too. Together. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Um, welcome everyone to Fate of Mates. I'm Sarah McLean. I read romance novels and I write them. And I'm Jennifer Prokop, a romance reader and editor. And this week we are reading, or uh, we read, I guess, Mary. I've read a million times. Sarah read for the first time, Mary Winterborn by the great Lisa Kleypas. I opened the vault mm-hmm. and I pulled out Mary Winterborn. And Reese Winterborn is everyone's book boyfriend for a reason, you guys. Yes. If you were like, if you like me have been, you know, happily engaging with Twitter, (laughs) with romance Twitter for the last however many years, and just thinking to yourself, there just is no way, there's no way this hero is this perfect. Well, he's like Christian Grey without being super creepy. No, he's a stop it. Right? Like, stop it. No, I'm serious. He is not at all like Christian Grey. Well, he's like a billionaire magnate who gives Helen whatever she wants. I mean, yeah, but he's also perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's interesting and, you know, has like a has a personality and a work ethic, so I understand. We actually see him at work all the time. And he's not a cipher at all. He is just pure emotion. Well, I think that's right. So let me confess something, everybody. (sighs) I don't know if I've ever told anybody this. Now is the time. The first time I started, I tried to read this book, I actually DNF'd it because I had not read Cold Hearted Rake. And it... It's interesting because Kleypas is really the queen of the secondary romance in a lot of ways, but it is unusual, I think, maybe I'm wrong, to have her essentially, like, tee up so much of a romance and then have the, the you know, like, the couple get their own whole book in the next book. Right. So I vaulted Winterborn because I had read Cold Hearted Rake, and the secondary romance is so terrific in that book. The tee up to this is just, I mean, it's so perfect that I was like, I have to, I have to vault this because I know, I know it's going to be great. So I started this book, you know, kind of cold and was like, what is going on? (laughs) Right? Like she shows up in his office and is asking for a new engagement ring and something he did. He had some very bad behavior, but he took care of her orchids. And I just remember (laughs) being deeply confused about what the fuck was going on. God, those orchids. Yeah. Oh my God. So should we talk about cold hearted rake just for, should we explain what happened in cold hearted rake? What's interesting to me about Lisa's writing in general, which is how absolutely fearless this woman is about a big, plotty set piece. I don't know what else to call it, right? So Winterborn and Devin Ravenel are on their way back to Eversby Priory, and their train crashes. (laughs) I mean, because of course it does. Right? I mean, because Lisa, nobody does it better, right? Right. Right. And I and I actually spent a lot of my time thinking about why it like why these big so anyway we'll get to that in a minute but uh, Winterborn is injured badly injured in the crash and Helen kind of defaults to taking care of him and the attraction between them is very sudden nobody has ever shown Reese Winterborn kindness yeah for no reason other than to be kind right right and so. And I think it's interesting, like, and Helen has never been able to, I think, show people what she's made of, 
Right? Mm-hmm. Like, she's just kind of this, like, calm, steady presence, but not someone who's, like, I don't know, good in a crisis, I guess. So um, these two kind of end up together, but they're really – He's a fish, like a fish out of water, right? He is interested in a high-born wife, just kind of sort of enter into the final stage of kind of the forbidden era of, you know, the forbidden zone of kind of the high-born British class, upper classes. Because he's, although he is the richest man in England, except for Tom Severin, he's still... Except for Tom. <laughs> he's still just a, like a grocer, right, to them. Well, and he's Welsh, which is important, yes. right? It comes up. This is, I mean, the whole, the entire plot of this book is basically Wales versus England. <laughs> right. Very, very, I like it. I like it now more yeah. than ever, right? Especially now, this week, you know, like post-Queen dying, where we know a lot about Wales versus England these days. Yes. And it feels, it felt like a good, a good thing to read. Yeah. So at the end, there's like a big, uh, like break up essentially, right? He tries to kiss her and she's overwhelmed or scared. And this is at Cold Heart. In- right. And Cold Heart. Kathleen goes and says, you know, she doesn't want anything to do with you and kind of gets her medals maybe where she shouldn't have. And then, you know, it's sort of a few weeks later at the beginning of this book. And Helen has decided that a mistake was made, right? Like Kathleen spoke for her, but she shouldn't have. And they go out of town. And so she, uh, Helen sees her opportunity to go fix it. But we are in Reese's POV at the start of this book, and he is consumed by thoughts of her. She's not even there, and he's like, I can't stop thinking about this woman. And listen, he is not going to be able to stop thinking about this woman for 390 pages. As it should be. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I would like to say, like, straight up before we start, this is a terrific book on audio. I find this book very deeply comforting. I read romance. There's a lot of different like romance moods that I have, and reading this book to me is like, and I I say this is like the greatest compliment. It's like getting in a bath, right? It is deeply com. This is a comfort read to me. I find being with Reese Winterborn, who knows what he wants and isn't going to let anyone get in his way. It, you know, I find this portrayal of insta love to be very compelling, and I'm a person who kind of likes insta love as a as a trope. I know a lot of people don't, but it's I think it's in some ways interesting to be like, okay, well, I've put them on page, I've made him instantly fall in love with her in a previous book. Now, how am I going to sustain this uh-huh. for 350 pages? And then it breaks a lot of like my personal romance rules about what I like. Okay, so. The exception always proves. All right, we need to talk about me though. (laughs) Okay. Because so I have not read this book until this until literally this morning I finished it. And it's amazing to me because when you read a book that literally everyone has read before and loves, right. And loved and like you know all the quotes, right? Yeah. Like I, I <laughs> was five wait- fucking minutes. <laughs> I mean, I was just waiting for them all to happen, right? And so what's fascinating about that is that you start to paint a picture in your head of what you think mm. this book will be. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Especially when you're me and like a Clapus evangelist, right? And so it's like when you're when you basically cut your teeth on devil on um, Devil in Winter and Dreaming of You, and like have read every one of her books up until the the Ravenel or the Ravenel. Is it Ravenel or Ravenel? Well, according to Mary Jane Wells, what does Mary say? Mary Jane, Ra- the Ravenels. Okay, so once you've you know you've read every book she's ever written, historical and contemporary, and then you you stop right because now I've vaulted the series. And you vol- I vaulted the series at this book because the setup for this relationship was so, like, powerful in Cold Hearted Rake. Like, yeah. it, it is one of those situations almost in, again, again, the magic style where there's a secondary love story that, like, almost overpowers, like, the primary love story because it's so electric. And, or at least for me, it was. You have this, like, you don't know what the book is. You just know when the quotes come, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> so what's fascinating about this is that then I, I read it, and it is 
nothing like what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Isn't that and fascinating? So, which yeah. was like shocking to me and, and surprising in like a really cool way because, you know, Lisa can still surprise me, which is great. Yeah. And I have lots of thoughts about why maybe this book is the way that it is. But yeah, it's structurally It's structurally so really fascinating. Different than everything that came before it with her. Yeah. So I reread this week by re-listening, right? Mm. I was kind of like, okay, I mean, just also because I I'm broken. Although everybody, I have my splint off and now I can use both hands, and that's kind of exciting. Yeah. Um, I could show Sarah my scar right now. It's really gnarly. Yeah. You want to see it? Is it hot? No, it's gross. Look Are you sure? I'll, I'll be the judge of that. <gasps> Ooh. It's pretty hot, you guys. Yeah. I've been, I think I'm going to need a new tattoo, everybody, to go over whatever that scar is. Um, I am a romance hero now. I mean, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Sure. Okay. So here's what I was thinking about, actually, as I was listening. Tell people you got it in a bare knuckle fight. Uh, I mean, sure. Somebody. Obviously. Wrote, yeah. With the shoe at Nordstrom. Right? <laughs> I'm going to say one thing, and then we can talk about the structure. One of the reasons this book works for me is because it is deeply romantic. Oh, my God. It's so romantic. Him sending, you know, like, crates from Winterborns and building her a glass house on top of the store and sleeping with her stocking under his pillow. He dislocates his shoulder and then is like, his first thought is like, I better get a lawyer because if yes. I have been harmed, like yes. seriously, what poor about Helen. Helen. Yeah. And then he just signs away his entire fortune to this woman. It's amazing. Regardless of like anything else, I really think that's probably why I love this book. Like, there's no grand gesture at the end. Every gesture from Reese Winterborn is a grand gesture. And I think that that is deeply romantic. And romances isn't, aren't always romantic, but this one really is. And I think that that's part of what I find so lovely about it. Yes, but somehow it is romantic without them really needing to be on the page all the time together, which is in light of our conversation yeah. last week about beginnings when we were like, oh, you know, romance is turning into this kind of this this genre where, you know, if the hero and heroine aren't on the page together a ton, yeah. the book isn't as successful. And here's the truth. They are on the page together for the first, like, what, 60 pages, and they bang like, oh, yeah. in that period. I mean, like, it is hot. It gets immediately to it. That's super rare in a historical. Mm-hmm. It's very rare in a Lisa Kleypas book. Like, it's a really interesting structural beginning. Yes. But then the deal, we'll talk about the plot just quickly. So they, Helen turns up at Winterborn um, at the at the uh, the department store. She asks to speak with him. She says to him, I made a mistake. I didn't mean for you to get pushed away. I was just a virgin and nervous and weird about kissing, and I've never kissed anybody before, and you're, oh, my God, you're <laughs> right. you. <laughs> right. And, I mean, same, Helen. <laughs> so this all happens, and then she says, so I want to marry you. Like, I, I, I want this to happen. And, you know, for a heartbeat, he's like, oh, no, you couldn't possibly. Right. Blah, blah, blah. And then, boom, he's like, great, so here's the way this is going to work. You're going to need to get ruined. <laughs> Um, we're, we're going to do it. And then nobody will be able to tell us we can't get married because he's like some Welsh son of a grocer and her, she's now like a Ravenel. Like she's connected to, you know, old money, old aristocratic money. So she's like, well, couldn't we just elope? And he's like, no, we definitely need to bang this out. (laughs) Well, because he's like, uh, I want a church wedding. Yeah. I want people to know that you came willingly and I didn't coerce you and all that stuff, right? And they're like, the like billionaire son of a Welsh grocer, self-made man wants to prove to the aristocracy that like he can be, like he can, he too can enter their ranks. (sighs) So (laughs) she's like, well, I guess if we have to do it, I guess we'll do it. I want to talk about that scene later because I am really Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're going to cut, we're, I'm just We'll go back to that. Your plot suffering. the plot. Fine, but then she says, okay, but we can't get married fast. We have to get married five months from now because I'm in mourning and also, I don't know, other romance reasons. And he's like, well, basically, yes, this is the biggest romance reason because this is what the plot is, everyone. (laughs) 
Yeah. So, and Re- and Reese is like, what? No, five months. It's a little bit of an echo of Sebastian, St. Vincent, who is now Kingston. But at the time, he was like, I can't not have sex for five months. What are you talking about? A man's about? natural urges, Sarah. <laughs> but different, because Reese is like, I can't not have sex with you for right. five months, right? Reese, from this moment on, will never notice another human No, never. Woman, ever. Like, no. they're just, it's on, they're unnecessary. <laughs> so... Um, now there's this five month break and they have to just kind of like exist in this world together without like, what I love is it's sort of like, well, if she gets pregnant, we'll get married. We'll figure it out then. Yeah. But like, it's basically going to be five months. And then these two idiots, I mean, they're banging all the time. It's a miracle. She doesn't get pregnant. (laughs) Um, but so what's amazing about it is then there's sort of this like push pull. It's all, it's really a book of. It's a very quiet book yeah. in a lot of ways, um, with the exception of, you know, the building falling or the, you know, suddenly there's like a orphanage situation. Like there are, and and I think that the structure of this book is so, I, when you, when you said to me, it feels like getting into a bath. Yeah. It, that makes perfect sense to me because if you need just that, like, Beautiful, romantic, soft, comfortable, certain read. Yes. This is that book. There is never a moment where you think these two are not going to end up together. And that's wild to me. I very much believed Helen thought maybe they wouldn't get together. And I think that's the only reason it works. Yes, absolutely. That is the only reason why it works. And this is threading the tiniest needle. Oh, yeah. Listen, do not try this at home. You are not, this is a professional driver on, <laughs> on a closed course. course. <laughs> this is Lisa Klepis yeah. somehow convincing us yeah. that this idiot heroine <laughs> could possibly believe that Reese Winterborn would ever let her out of his sight. And I think I paid a lot more attention to Helen this time around when I was, like, listening. Because I was like, okay, so basically this book has, like, three acts. Like, very clear three acts. I mean, right? You get to the end of Chapter 11 where, right, she's been ruined. She has – she kind of figures out she likes shocking people, right? But she's still so sheltered and they go – they're going to go back to Hampshire and it's going to be five months. And then – Two is she discovers she's known for a long time that her she was a her mother had had an affair out of wedlock, but she f- discovers that her real father is Albion Vance. Uh, Kate made a joke this morning about Albion, and I didn't know what it meant. Apparently, it is slang for Great Britain. Yeah, it's right? the original name for Britain, for yeah. Britain, for England, for England, right? And I was like, oh, of course, he's named Albion. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. And th- so the and her like very real dilemma. I it seemed real to me of like I should tell him the truth, and everybody around her being like that's not a good idea. And I like want to talk about that. And then the third act, which is essentially like the orphanage movement. Yeah. Right. The real when like it's drama when things happen. Yeah. So one of the things I was I was really fascinated. Okay, everybody knows I like a heroine backed into a corner. So Helen finds her mother's diaries and she's like, I know now who my father is. And then very quickly, of course, it's revealed that this is Reese Winterborn's like most hated. I mean, like the, the only man he's ever noticed because he's so busy with <laughs> noticing Helen. Right. He's like, I fucking he's hate this. Notice Helen and this other guy. And this guy, right? <laughs> Albion Vance. And so the thing that I found myself really fascinated by is, okay, so Helen has is now told by multiple people, Lady Barrick, and also by the valet Quincy, Quincy, right, that she should under no circumstances tell him the truth. Listen, here's what I'll say about all of this. Yeah. Sometimes no new friends is an important piece <laughs> of the puzzle in life. And you should trust only the people who know you best in the world. Yeah. Because Helen takes the advice of these two people, like, who she ob- who obviously have their opinions about this, this whole s- situation. I mean, Quincy has witnessed Reese 
being, you know, a sure. uh, grumbling man about Albie and Vance. Yeah. And Beric, who is Albie and Vance's aunt, yes. and knows how terrible this man is, who's right. going to inherit an earldom, by the way, is like, hey, listen, you need to watch yourself because he's going to invent in he's going to inherit an earldom and you can't just yeah like you can't just ha- you can't just feel the way you feel about him like th- this is a person you are going to have to negotiate in the world with right um and so Barrack is very concerned about appearances and Quincy is very concerned about like what he knows to be true about the kind, right the kind of man he is yes which is such a romance hero moment it has that sort of just slight echo of Lord of Scoundrels where we see Dane through all these other men yes. in his orbit. Yes. And in that and so we get a sort of different he's refracted in a different way through these third parties. Yeah. Including Devin, Severin. Yep. Sure. You know. And others. Well, and I think that that's the part that like uh, Fernsby, right? His his secretary, his and, awesome secretary, right? And then Doctor, and then the Doctor Gib- Gibson, right? I mean, it, well, no, Doctor Gibson, but also the, his Doctor. Oh, the, at the other store, Doctor, right? Fernsby's boy, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fernsby's boyfriend. <laughs> I've read a million historical romances, obviously, and the plight of women, like how powerless they really are in the face of society has always been, like, sort of shown to me essentially at, like, the the beginning of a woman's life, mm. right? As she's entering the marriage market, you're good for one of two things, right? You're good to essentially be a breeder or to, like, bring money either to this, to a good match or extract money out, right, essentially, and save the right. family. And I was really fascinated by Lady Barrick's fears about what the end of her life would be like once her husband died and she was going to be at the mercy of this this awful man Mm -hmm. and how little leeway she really knew she had and and i think that's part of the reason i think even though like the 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 pool like the surface of this was so placid in a lot of ways, mm. I think it's really masterful at showing, like, the machinations underneath for right. how how motivation. all of this really is working. Yeah. I mean, motivation is so critical in every, obviously, in every book yeah. for every character. It's extra critical in romance because we're sort of constantly attempting to hold two people back from being right. together. Um, but in this book, it's so essential because the entire book hinges on Helen believing yes. that these real strangers to her, I mean, she knows Quincy fine, but like right. she, but mostly these like kind of strangers to her are correct in their assessment of Winterborn. Yes. And of society writ large. Because a big part of the Ravenel's backstory, and one that I think Clapus uses, like, really well, as, uh, kind of throughout, is that these girls, right, Cassandra and Pandora and Helen, have been essentially, like, sequestered away in the Barbie dream house of Eversby Priory for their entire lives, and although they are part and parcel of the aristocracy, they are also complete innocents in the face of it, Mm -hmm. right? So they know all the rules, and they know how they're supposed to act, but they have, like, no sense at all. They're, like, of how how it really plays out. Mm -hmm. And so this, this whole thing about Helen, like, sort of, like, like, figuring out at the beginning she kind of likes shocking people, Turning into the Helen who's going to go and rescue her half-sister from an orphanage in a terrible part of town mm-hmm. with just another woman. And I I believed it, right? I believed that that Helen, who had been raised at Eversby Priory thinking family was everything, would would make, would make this choice at the end. Of course. Right? Of course. I mean, yeah. also, there is literally no Clapus set piece more Clapus set piece 
than that one. Yes. Right? Like, 100%. There is an orphanage, a child <laughs> has gone missing. Yeah. And a, le- a letter is sent, a letter is received. The child yes. is in a terrible location in London. And there's just, I mean, we must go there. Yes. And when we get there, suddenly we are going to see this heroine like spine, yes. stiff, totally like stiff like iron because of how she has changed through the love of the hero. I yeah. mean, it is so Kleypas. A hundred It's her core story. Right. Right. But that's, I think, the part where she makes it look really easy. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> because none, I mean, because you get there and if, again, professional driver, close course. <laughs> the, because if you get there in the hands of a lesser writer, you're like, what the heck is happening here? Right. Right. But like, Somehow she has thread this needle so perfectly that we believe that all the whole book has been coming to this moment right. where Helen comes into her own. Yes. And so when you say that you read this book thinking more about Helen on this reread, that's – so I've only read it once, right? I haven't had a reread. Right. So Reese is like – he's like the fucking Larger son. than life. It's oh, like yeah. It's like impossible to – it's impossible not to look at him. And as we're talking, I'm realizing that, like, Lisa's so smart because he's not on page with Helen very much. Because he book. sucks up. I mean. Because he takes up all the air. Let's in the room. be honest, though. If I mean, this is. But I'm when call Helen it, is alone. Yes. She's an orchid, right? Right. Sorry, go on. Well, I think, like, I'm going to. It's not a problem. But, like, this is. If it is a problem, it's a great problem to have. Every mm-hmm. clip, every clip of zero is like this, right? Like, I mean, Derek Craven and St. Vincent and Reese Winterborn and West know. Ravenel. Derek Craven s- sucks up all the air in the room. Like, Sarah's really powerful. Yes. I mean, I like Sarah fine. I do. But I love Derek Craven, right? I like Evie fine. That's but I, mean, I love St. Vincent, right? Lisa loves her heroes. Sure. She loves her heroes more than she loves her heroines. It's just, like, it's right. just true. It's obvious. I all, I, I mean, right. I, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'm not saying, No, no, right? no, no, no. Some of us are hero writers. Sure. And some of us are heroine writers. And some of us remar- remarkably do both. And right. well, I don't know who those people are. But, you know, there's... But she is, but yeah, I mean, Winterborn, like you said, yeah. he's just, he eclipses everything when yeah. he's on the page. Right. And I think that then, so then, like, right, like, if you know that. So we have to see her alone. We have to see her alone. And we have to give her a journey that is, I mean, I think it's really also, it's very interesting because this, again, this reveal that she has known for a long time that she is not actually a Winterborn. And her, like, sort of thinking about what that might mean for herself, the kind of person she is, is really fascinating to me because the Ravenels. She's not actually oh, sorry, a Ravenel. sorry. She's not a Ravenel. The Ravenels are so, like, like they're like a story out of legend in England, right? Like, every Ravenel is hot tempered, <laughs> like, right? Like, they're and gonna. Weird. And right? Like, just like, <laughs> f- like, just full of fury and fire. And I think that then when you get Helen, who's sort of, like, missish, like, literally at the beginning, right? Well, she's very different than those girls. Very different. And at first you kind of don't – you don't pay attention to it as much in Cold Hearted Rake, but, you know, you really see it here. And I think I, I – I'm going to say some real English teacher. It's fine. I found myself a lot thinking about the name Helen, which was – when I was a kid, my – I think my grandma had a friend named Helen, maybe, or something. And it was always like a real old lady name to me. I mean, I'll be honest. No offense to all the Helens out there. Because, of course, you are also named after the most beautiful woman in the world, right? Helen of Troy. And I found myself really thinking about, like, one of the things I've never understood, because I'm not as steeped in Greek mythology as some folks are, is, like, why was everybody going to war for Helen of Troy? <laughs> like, right? Like, what did she... I mean, so she Surely was Surely someone else looked great. Yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> right? Like, all these men really went Helen to war. Helen of Troy is a 10. She, but you have to go to war for her. For 10 fucking years. <laughs> right? And then takes another 10 to get home. What were these men doing? <laughs> 
And I did find myself like the f- you find know, f- yourselves a nine. Yeah, right? The first time I read this book, I was all Reese Winterborn. It took me a long time to be like, wait, what is what does Helen mean to him? Right? It's it's obviously the entry into society. It's her care for him, right? It's that's all like all Reese. I mean, it, for me, it was, and this is again thanks to Cold Hearted Rake because I actually think. Without Cold Hearted Rake, this book probably reads very differently. Yes. Because the immense kindness that she shows him to him in that book, coupled with that that very beginning. So all right, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say a thing and then we need to put a pin in thing and talk and talk about it later. But coupled with that moment about the diamond, like yes. I don't want the diamond. Yes. I want this like other this I want this stone. other ring. Like I want a moonstone. I want, you know, whatever. And these kind of moments where he sees that she doesn't want him for the thing that he perceives as his only value and that the whole rest of the world perceives as his only value. Yes. And he's so shattered by this. Mm-hmm. That's all she is to him. She's yes. just pure kindness. Yeah. She wants him for him. You know, that's deeply romantic, Sarah. I know it is. <laughs> I know. This week's episode of Faded Mates is sponsored by MJoy. This is really cool. MJoy is a sexual well being audio app for women. MJoy believes that all women should have access to sexual education and sexual therapy and gives us access to a huge library of audio guides, well-being tutorials, and erotic stories. You can download MJoy today to learn how to climax consistently, accept your body, and improve your relationships. What's really cool is all of MJoy's content is scientifically backed and created by a team of sexual health experts, and they release new batches of audio erotica every single week. You can find MJoy on the Apple App Store and in the Google Play Store. And as a special offer to our listeners, you are able to get a 14-day free trial to MJoy using the link Let's mjoy.com slash mates. That's E for erotic, M for M, J for joy. (laughs) And you will need to use this link. There's no way to enter the code right into the app. And since all of mjoy's content is scientifically backed and created by a team of sexual health experts, and they release new batches of audio erotica every week, this is an app that you are going to want to check out as soon as possible. Once again, that's let's mjoy.com slash mates. And thanks to mjoy for sponsoring the episode. So can we talk about talismans though? Yes. Because we've talked about this before on the podcast and people often message us and say like, you talk about this when you talk about Lisa, but could you like say more, explain it? And then there's never like a good time to talk about it. So let's talk here. We are. It's a perfect time. Um, in my view, all romance novelists have like a tell. There's like a fingerprint in all mm-hmm. of our books. And if you've read, you know, 25 Sophie Jordan books or 25 Kennedy Ryan books or whatever, there's a fingerprint. There's just like the thing that you see us use again and again um, or or the thing that we clearly love mm-hmm. again and again. What Lisa does, I think, better than almost any of us is use objects Mm-hmm. as representative of feelings or um, themes or... Like the know, state of their relationship, uh, exactly. right? Exactly. And so, and sh- there are so many in this book. There are so mm-hmm. many items that appear that are like really beautiful talismans that rep- that represent much more than what they seem mm-hmm. on the page. Um, the ring, of course, you know, and and it's sort of obvious what's going on there. Like, right. you know, but also in Cold Hearted Rake, and then through this this whole book, the orchid, the right? These sort of, the orchids are notoriously difficult to keep alive. They're like impossible I to am keep aware. flowering. <laughs> I know. Right? I've killed a lot of orchids every I've day. had one that has green, that like flowered one time and has had beautiful green leaves for years and has never flowered again. And Christina from Christina Lauren and Kate Claiborne's dad have both tried to help me 
like make this thing flower and it just won't do it, right? But so orchids are notoriously difficult. So is Winterborn. Right. Right? Yes. And so is Ellen. Helen. Yeah. These are two characters who are very diff- it is very difficult for either of them to either be protected, cultivated or for them to grow into their into their full bloom, most beautiful being. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of, there's another one that I marked. (laughs) Well, but I mean, I think like, I don't know what else was on your list, but like, is this thing about like her bustle, this business about, um, the stockings, the stockings, right? Like her clothing, clothing in general. Yes. It's funny because in the author's note, she talks about researching clothing and she talks about the bustle. Um, but this book, almost more than any of her other books, really, like, yes, really sits in clothing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the, the clothing, Helen's clothing, and then the clothing for the child, for charity. Yes. Right? Well, and and I think, so I found myself, I mean, obviously thinking about a lot of that oh, stuff, Oh, the peppermints. Too. The peppermints. His peppermints. Right? Which are oh, such yeah. a treat for somebody who never yeah. had right. access, right? Um, lots of baths in this book, which maybe is why I think it's like a bath. There's like a but little. Also, there's this like sense of... I mean, there's so much money in this book. Oh, yeah. And it's really fascinating because Lisa loves money, right? She loves, like— Don't we all? I mean, we all do. But, the I mean, Lisa loves, like, heroes who own shit and build shit and sell shit. Like, oh, yeah. She likes, she likes men who are men of business. Yes. Right? Industry. Yeah. Yes. And it's really fascinating because I don't think, like, I thought— I thought we'd done this, like, with Harry Rutledge in the, mm-hmm. you know, in the last series. I mean, that's your vault. I have not. Yeah, series. I've, I've vaulted the right. pathways. Like, I thought I thought we had, like, gotten to peak industry in the last series. And, like, we've, we've seen, you know, McKenna. We've seen, we've seen railway men before. Like, there are also, like, we've seen money yeah. before. But, like, wow, does Winterborn have money? Well, and Winterborn knows how to spend it. I mean, he invents like a glass house on a roof. Yeah, a greenhouse, a roof, right? a rooftop greenhouse, yeah. greenhouse, and like it's just a sort of the moment, like when he's like, "We're gonna go get married, right? Like we're gonna finally, finally, these two idiots are gonna go and like get a special license and get the hell out of here and get married." And he's like, "Take a note, Fernsby," <laughs> and he needs like. Seven thousand items packed into his private wa- railway car, and it's like just get it done. Yeah, and he's like, money is no object, obviously, and it's fascinating because it feels great in a way that it doesn't <laughs> well, feel great always. Like yeah, with a billionaire, right, right. Well, and I think that that's because he recognizes her, that her clothes are patched right that they're like older that she, that they're out of date yep. right but he also like the part where he essentially like lures lady barrack into the store with the promise of gloves even kangaroo mm. right right like this is a man who can who can but he also is like so deeply familiar with like the wares in his store yeah right like the part where he talks about like like menstrual products yeah. Oh, I love right? that bit. We carry them in the pharmacy, or right? Or and I love it. At one point, Helen says to him, "You know a lot about women," and he says, "I know a lot about what women buy." Yeah, and I think that's part of why is it's he is deep, like right, deeply familiar with it because it's how he it's has business. Yeah, it's business. He is he's not you know he's right there in it. Right, it, every part of the store is under his control. 
I also think it's because he's deeply um, democratic in, like, who he hires, right? Mm -hmm. Like, he has women working for him. Fernsby was going to be turned away, but he hired her. He's willing to hire Garrett Gibson. He admires and understands hard work, right? Mm -hmm. He's picking off the best servants from, uh, like, you know, old boards, right? Who, like, can't afford to put them, you know, keep them in employ anymore. It's, it is, it's really interesting, but. But also, it's a perfect example of, like, really strong character work. Yes. Because the fact that he is so good at spending money, mm-hmm. right? That he knows the he knows the inventory in the store, all of the stuff that you just said, what it does is underscore just how out of character and important it is when he takes an afternoon off yes. or clears the calendar for a week to yes. go see Helen. Right. Like and like look, you could do that in a book and just And just, like, write it, right? Right. You could write the sentence. Like, he'd never done that before. No. But we understand. In fact, like, it says, I think Lisa does write something almost identical to that when he takes that afternoon off. He'd never asked for that before. But there's a difference between, like, telling me that. And showing, yeah. And then showing me, like, how much he works. Right. Right. And I think that's also the part. If it, we did not get the tragic story of his friend Yon, I don't think that we would really believe how long this would last. Because it would be very easy to believe that, like, once he, you know, sort of gets Helen and marries her, that he would go back to, like, working, like, this way. But this cautionary tale from his past... We have to really sort of believe that this has impacted him, that he will not make the same mistakes that his friend made when it came Mm -hmm. to, like, having a happy marriage. He's, you know, and that's the part, I think, again, like, she really cleverly anticipates what my concerns, right, about him would have been. Yeah. Can we talk about community? Yes. Can we talk about this? I want to talk about how Helen, like Helen's broad community, and also I, th- I think this goes hand in hand with what you were saying about how in order for the conflict to work, like in order for, the conflict in this book is not, as readers, we don't believe Reese will stay. Like at no point do we believe that. Right. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> like all we, the whole conflict is that we believe, Helen believes, right? Yes. And so there, what's interesting to me about this is so often when we give a heroine, particularly one like Helen, or when we see those a heroine like Helen on the Helen on the page, her community is like completely supportive mm-hmm. and like always in service to her best interests. And they sort of assist her in making good choices. Right. But in this case, and she has that, right? She has these like she has Kathleen and mm-hmm her younger sisters, and she's so, it's so obvious that she has this, like, beloved community of uh, this sisterhood. Well, and the servants and the staff, too, the housekeeper, Quincy. Yes, everybody in her, in service to her. And she has these other people, too, who are trying, who are trying to, like, help in some way. And Reese could have been, because he is the son, right, he could have been a man on an island, but Lisa gives him some real people yes. who care about him. Yes. Severin, yeah. Devin even. Devin like, there's even, There's a sense yeah. of, like, rich, masculine friendship here mm-hmm. um, that's really great and, again, makes him somehow takes this, like, living God and, like— Makes him a little believable. Brings him right. to Earth. Plus, you get to see them all beating each other up. Yes. Well, I think part of the reason it's particularly interesting, like, Helen's community outside of Quincy is women. And yeah, they're also, it's like women and servants. I mean, Kathleen is her sister-in-law, but, you know, is ultimately going to be powerless And, like, as well. West a little, maybe? West, for sure, right? Um, but it's clear to her that she felt deeply betrayed by her immediate family, like her parents, obviously, and her her brother even. Although there's like the one scene where he's the one that teaches her about getting her period. I want to talk about oh, that actually a lot. But oh yeah. There's so much I want there's so much body stuff in here. I think it's one of the reasons she's actually pretty quick or or assumes and we believe that she would assume that Reese will not 
is is not as like strong or as steady is because she has seen the men in her world, right? Except for Devin and West, and that's pretty recent. Really, not be as supportive as these other people, right? Mm-hmm. So you can kind of believe like that she would think, well, I'm not sure I can trust this man, mm-hmm. right? Again, I, I, I I'm gonna have to go and save this girl by myself because. These men really can't be trusted when it comes to yeah. women's work. And no one betrays her. No one. Like, there is, because she also, I mean, it's fascinating. I think there's a really interesting moment where, you know, when she knows she has to go to the orphanage, she has this rich fabric of community, right? She mm-hmm. could go to anybody for help, and she chooses to go to Gibson. Yep. Which is smart, because she's like, Gibson's probably been there. Like, right. she... You know, there are lots of reasons why Gibson is a good choice, but she may not be, like, she's not, like, the obvious choice. Right. Right? Except Helen's really smart. Yeah. Right? And at this point, Helen is smart. Her spine has fully grown. Yes. And she's, like, she knows she has a goal and she's going to achieve it. Right. Right? And in that moment, she chooses, like, she makes a really interesting choice there, not just in Garrett, but also in, like, I'm going to have to live my life without Reese. Right. Because. Sure. So I might as well live my life about Reese with this child. Yeah. Who is important. She's yeah. my sister. Um, And I think, like, there, there's something really fascinating there about, like. Yeah. Who, like, Helen kind of, like. Gets to that moment in the third act and chooses herself. Yeah. Well, and, and in order to choose herself, she has to make she's she's like choosing community. She's choosing like I'm going to go get Gibson, but Gibson doesn't like. Lisa could have made it so that Gibson walks away from her and immediately goes to Reese. Yep, but she does it. No, right? And that's the thing. It's like I'm really fascinated by like watching women. And this to me was is very re- very reminiscent of the Hell's Bells. Watching women behind the scenes do the work that they have to do to like make it work for them. And that's very different, right? This is so I mean, this is like at a way lower frequency. Yeah. But you know, like Garrett Gibson is gonna be the one who can take me to this orphanage and can like fight our way out of there because she knows she has a fencing master or whatever. And I'm and you know and right when she canes that guy in the groin and yeah, you're like, all right, right. right. Cool, and, Garrett. and the housekeeper is gonna be the one who is gonna help me uh like pack my bags. Pack my bags and get me away from here. And and my sisters and I and I did. I I again this is I've it was only after listing, you know, after a couple of reads where I was really able to like like kind of look see past the blazing sun of Reese Winterborn and and see how interesting Helen's journey really is. Mm-hmm. And I especially want to now I one of the things so the first time I listened to this book was like high pandemic. I remember because I was working on a puzzle. I was listening to the whole scene where Helen, where Reese essentially discovers that she had no knowledge of sex. None. And he's horrified. He's like, why don't women, why, don't women talk stuff? to each other? And I remember at that moment in time kind of thinking like, yeah, that's so archaic. And then really realizing like we right now are mm-hmm. living in a society where a good number of Republicans would like very much to put every woman right back in Helen's place. Yes. I had that moment this morning when I got to the part where Kathleen says, did he spend inside you? Yes. And she's like, and she's like, what? What? And he, she's like, okay, we're going to have a talk. Yeah. I mean, and I think I've told this story before. I went, I went to Catholic schools, but had, I don't know, I guess read a lot of romance. I mean, I learned a lot about sex ed from romance. But remember my freshman year of college, I went to Villanova. So it was like a lot of kids from Catholic schools. That there was like a girl on my hall who had really no idea why she got her period. Like it happened, but she wasn't quite sure why. And I remember being like, what the fuck? And the fact that like this is 18 whatever and we are still here and it's really easy to kind of be like i don't know just like sort of think like oh my god poor helen she had no idea but like that whole scene it's the most thorough like deflowering of a virgin kind of scene that i have ever read 
And I think it is really a, like a, I don't, I think it is like overtly political in its aims. Yes. I a thousand percent agree. You know, I've been reading, I've reread a lot of Lisa over the last yeah. few months. And um, I mean, if you want to talk about somebody who, a writer who has clearly been political about sex for a long time. For a long time. And it's fascinating because you you wouldn't expect it, right? You right. just wouldn't. The books, that's not what the books are, are about. Right. But, um, you know, I don't think I talked about this when I reread again The Magic recently, but in Again The Magic, the secondary romance um, is the the hero of the secondary romance his prior, he was with a woman who had an abortion. Mm-hmm. And he, I mean, and there was no judgment. It was like he, you know, she yep. she did not want to have the child. And so she had an abortion and it was botched yeah. and she died. Um, and the heroine of that secondary romance had had, had been pregnant and lost the child, had a miscarriage. And it was fascinating because I don't think I had clocked that mm-hmm. on any of my prior readings. Yeah. And, but like, we're talking so much now about like abortion on page, like what, how we view about abortion, how we talk about it on page. And Lisa, I mean, um, the, you know, Evie and Sebastian have a conversation about, um, about IUDs. Right. Like, a, yeah, right. Like there are things we can do, right? Yeah. I mean, like. It's really fascinating how much Lisa has talked about sex and autonomy. Yes. Yeah. Over, you know, three decades. And I think it's it's part and it, the groundwork for a lot of this is in Kathleen's book as well, right? Who is like a virgin widow, which is the only kind of virgin I typically really like. But you know, because I'm fast, it's like the what circumstances got you there. But you know, she had no idea, no idea what was going on. And the way that like women's and then her determination and Helen's as well to make sure that the twins were not gonna be that oblivious, right? Mm-hmm. Like that there there was this sense of we have some power to tell these younger women now that we are in charge of that, like we can, that like they should know things. And even Garrett Gibson, right? Like is very clear about like what charities, what use charity might be later, right? Like yeah. what's going to happen to these girls. And I, and I think like, I, I really did. I, I, I think part of the reason I, on that, like at that point in time when I l- was listening to it and sort of had my like, oh my God, women back then just knew nothing. And then like really had to sit really hard <laughs> with my feelings of like, well, here we fucking are. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's another reason why I re- like really love this book. Mm-hmm. Right? Like his outrage and sort of like I'll sort of tell you as we go along and it's like kind of deeply like sweet and sexy and like, but really like to have her be so right. And when she says like, it's the husband's job to tell her, right. Right. I, there's a lot of women in our country right now who not only believe that, but have been taught that. And it's so, but here's what I want to know. If it's the husband's job to teach them, how do the husband, the husbands don't know how the hell it all works either. Right. Well, I mean, that's it. Like, or they don't care. They don't see it as a responsibility the way, the way that Reese does. No. I mean, because Reese Witherspoon. Why do I keep saying that? Because of Reese Witherspoon. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Because Reese Winterborn is a king. This week's episode of Faded Mates is sponsored by Lucy LaRue, author of Making Her His, the first book in the Singular Obsession series. So many of you guys have sent us emails asking or messages asking for stepbrother romances, and this one is for you. Uh, The hero, Alex, is in his 20s when his widower of a father gets remarried to a woman that he wants nothing to do with. Um, But he, you know, over time ends up meeting this woman and her daughter, Ellen. His new stepsister. His new stepsister. And um, he can't help but sort of be be drawn to this 
this girl who, and they become friends. They become like yeah. very good friends. He's 10 years older than her. And of course, once, you know, everything's fine until one day, she's not a girl anymore. She's a woman and he can't help but notice. Uh, and that's that. He's done waiting and yeah, goes right for her. Listen, the singular obsession title of this series is so great because it really hints at sort of that like forbidden taboo element that sometimes is just so fun to read about. So if you are interested in finding out more about Lucy LaRue, you can follow her on Instagram or Twitter at Lucy the Novelist and Making Her His is available in print, KU and audio. Thank you to Lucy LaRue for sponsoring this week's episode of the show. Can we come back to King? Yes. Okay, because please, please. I'm just going to show you. Can you read? Uh, is that backwards for you? Yeah. I, well, it's. Okay. Yeah. It says, Winterborn crushed by a building and survives! Exclamation point. King! Exclamation yes. <laughs> point. Right. F- Listen, thrown off a train. Survive. I've said it before, yeah. and I will say it until I die, but romance heroes should be kings. And Reese, Reese Winterborn, Winterborn is, a is a king. Yeah. I mean, he literally, <laughs> he literally, again, so Clapus, like the most clapus moment ever, <laughs> where like suddenly this like slum that he's going to buy sure. and turn into middle class housing for like employees of the Winterborn Corporation. <laughs> I know. Right? Is going to collapse and he, it's going to crush a child and he like, is crushed by a building and in, like just dislocates his shoulder. Yeah, sure. And he still it's goes. Just, and then, yeah. and then the boy pickpockets. <laughs> and then it's I like, loved it. and then in comes Gibson, who's an absolute delight. You know what like, it reminded me of? Like that scene is where like Roy Kent is like given a Rolex to an ex girlfriend, and yes. I'm like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> what I need. I don't need two ways right? to tell time. And so Garrett Gibson <laughs> comes to save him. But I I mean, I... Re- and wait, so you and I disagree about this. Oh, so yeah. This again, is you guys, I vaulted this whole series, so I don't know what is to come. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I texted Jen this morning, hey, is Garrett Gibson going to end up with Severin? And I was like, and what? she didn't reply to me. <laughs> and then but right before we started recording, I was like, is Gibson, is it going to be Gibson and Severin? And she was like, no, it's going to be Gibson and Ransom. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, but there's the moment where they're like electric together. What do you mean it's going to be Ransom? And it's so. And Jen was like, I don't, it we'll tell them. Yeah. I was like, it, so I think part of it is because then when Ransom and, and Garrett get on page later, that to me was more electric. Well, that was right? also great. Yeah. But there were, but I, but by that point I'd gone 200 pages of like <laughs> head cannoning Gibson and Severin, like having naked arm wrestling matches. And I was yeah. like, it's going to be the greatest. I can't wait. No, see, no, I just enjoyed. Stephen ends up with Cassandra. Yes, yes. I'm. I don't even know. I mean, you just it's like a like, whole what? new world. It's like starting a whole new. Yeah, maybe I just life. couldn't see it because I already knew. I also read this series. I am an out of series order reader. Out of order, whatever, however you'd say that. I never read You're series. Chaotic. I'm a chaotic reader, which is why I DNF this was the first time I read it. So I did not read any of these books in order. I read. I eventually went to Cold Hearted Rake. Oh, no, I read Devil and Spring way before any of the rest of them. Then at some point went back to Cold Hearted Rake and realized I could read Marrying Winterborn. I think I read the whatever Gib- Garrett Gibson's is, something Stranger. And Hello then Stranger. Hello Stranger and read Devil's Daughter last. I mean, I completely read this. Even once I start a series and I'm like, oh, I like this, I very rarely read it in order. So, yeah, I just all along knew it wasn't going to be Severin. So I think I just never had that. Well, listen, Lisa, <laughs> I mean, you just, you you got me. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Anyway, if you two read Marrying Winterborn for the first time this week, would you please let us know if you clocked Severin and uh, Gibson. Gibson or Ransom and Gibson? I mean, obviously, it's set up that it could be either one, but mm. I just want to know. Interesting. Who yeah. who was shipping? Um, who was shipping who? Severin no. and and uh, Gibson. <laughs> and all right, can we talk about how much fucking sex there is? In this oh book? my god, so much sex! It's like they are, they do it all the time. God, I loved it. I thought it was great. 
I know it's it's amazing. Like every time they they are not on page together all the time, as we've established. But when they are, they're doing well, it. When they are, they're just they. I cannot keep their hands off each I'm other. I'm all and over. It's great. It is great. My so I love a heroine who's like I like this. Yeah, I want it. I want him. Yeah. Yeah, he, you know, I'm so one of my favorite scenes in this book is, and it's like deeply funny when um, Mary Jane Wells reads it, is when, um, so he's, you know, dislocated his shoulder <laughs> and then shows up anyway for calling hours because he told Helen he would, of uh, course. It's so great. Right? And they disappear. And then we get Helen and Kathleen talking. And Helen's like, I've been ruined. <laughs> and Kathleen's like, what? Well, you know, we just have to really think about how we're going to tell Devin. And she's like, he's going to tell him tonight. And Kathleen's yeah. like, we have to stop him. And, and, <laughs> and the fact that Helen's like, but how do you know he hasn't told him already? And Helen's like, well, we'd hear a crash. And then, like, boom, all of a sudden. <laughs> like, that entire scene to me was like, so funny. I mean, right? Like, just really, truly funny. And then, like, Devin's all like, you know, like, my kinswoman's been defiled. And Kathleen's like, we fucked everywhere and everywhere. From here to Scotland. I mean, what on earth? And Devin's like, well, that's different. I mean, I really did. I (laughs) That was so cute when he said, that's different. I couldn't keep my hands off. Yes. (laughs) I loved, I did. I mean, I think that's I just wanted you so much. Yes, because. right. And she's like, well, what do you think's happening with these two dummies? Right? Yeah. I will say that I really love those. Claypus always, she's, she delivers that moment a lot with yeah. like a prior couple. Suddenly the POV sort of follows the prior couple for just a heartbeat. And yes. we see them like through in bed about to, usually about to bang. And they're. Fine. And they're like, what do you think about these two dummies? I mean, <laughs> I, know. I love it. so cute because yeah. we obviously know about these two dummies, but, like, it's nice to see them. It's yeah. Like a little reader Karen feeding. Yeah. Wait, you have to tell everybody what you said to me earlier about the the building falling and how. Oh, yeah. It, so, uh, okay. Like, what it means. Again, professional driver, closed course, right? <laughs> Like, I really want to say this. <laughs> One of the things that Claypus does better than anyone is leveraging a completely over-the-top plot, plotting incident, like a plot point, right? And one well, of, it's usually not a plot point. It usually has nothing to do with the right. plot. It's, it's just like a thing. Some that random fucking thing happens. And the and here's the thing. Like, and I've said this before. I bet if I like search my own tweets, I'd said it. Like in real life, random things happen. Right? In a romance novel, when random things happen, it almost always feels like an author who just doesn't really know what to do. Right? And furthermore, one of the reasons I feel that way is because almost always those random things that happen happen at a time to keep something from happening. Right? So this, it's this rom com, and these two people are finally going to kiss, and it's, but it's 33% instead of 75%, and therefore the doorbell has to ring, right? Or the FedEx man has to arrive to deliver a package, or, you know, something has to interrupt them. So the random thing that happens is clearly just designed to stop. What should be, like, right, we all see the natural progression of the scene, but I have to stop it so random things can happen. With Claypus, <laughs> random fucking things happen, but they are never designed to, like, put a stop to a scene. No. Instead, it's just designed to, like, kind of throw everything up in the air and see where shit lands, right? So, you know, when Devin and Winterborn crash in the train, there's no real— In com- cold-hearted rake. In cold-hearted rake, right? There's no, like— thing that's like right like hanging on this it's just a thing that happens meanwhile listen one of my favorite parts of that book is he Devin is like Wes saves him and he comes out of the carriage and like all the servants and Kathleen are rushing down because they've heard that the train has crashed and Devin staggers out of the fucking coach and just grabs her and kisses her in front of everybody. It's awesome, right? (laughs) It's like, it's the opposite. It's not going to stop him. It is going to, right? It urges them towards Yes, exactly. In in, Well, as it does here with the will. Right, exactly. So when he, the building falls on him, the first thing he does is call his lawyer. 
and be like, I want Helen to get everything. And the guy's like, if there's a child, he's like, I want Helen to get everything. <laughs> Did I stutter? Right? It's what I want. And I well, and then and then because he's dislocated his shoulder, which is extremely painful. Yes. And probably could stand to go home and take a nap. Sure. Instead, no, no. He promised he would turn up yes. at regular calling hours right. at the Ravenel house. And by God, he is going to do it because he promised Helen, Helen he, he would. would. Right. And I'm like, yes. these men we're married to <laughs> get a sniffle and take to their beds. You know, Reese Witherspoon gets. <laughs> Reese Witherspoon. <laughs> I keep calling him that. I love it though, right? Reese Winterborn gets basically crushed by a building, building yeah. and it's stopping like, him. I will be at your home by seven p.m. Yes, <laughs> right. Well, like thirty minutes to spare. But I think, and but I did. I found myself really, even Helen finding. So Helen has known all along that her mother had an affair, and she is essentially packing to go to her new home, right? She knows she'll have. And so she's packing up her mother's diaries and journals. And then, you know, there's like this little, you know, sudden I'm, suddenly I'm going to find something. And it's like a, a, she finally figures out the identity of her father. Like she just has a name for the first time. And I found myself thinking like, this is a case then where it's not like at that moment she has no idea. It, she finds out after who Albion Vance is to Winterborn. So I found myself thinking, like, why is it I'm okay with these, like, coincidental, like, boom, it drops into the plot? Because she's Lisa Claypus, right? Because and she's, that's good it. At the, she's, she's so good at the job. She's just better than all of us. Right. And it's it's very difficult, I think, as an author to – put a believable, like, random thing in, boom, this happened. And I really found myself thinking so much about it because it's not, it doesn't matter what the boom the thing that is that happened. It matters how believable the characters are. How are they going to react to this thing? Mm -hmm. It can't keep them from doing something. It has to show us who they are, right? And and so I found myself thinking, like, like, look, if Reese Winterborn was going to fucking kiss Helen and the FedEx man knocked on the door, he would not give a flying fuck. He, was, he doesn't right? need that package. No, he does He'll not. He'll just buy another one. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, I think, why I find, I, I, I really did. I found, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about how, why am I willing to buy a random, you know, whatever. <laughs> and it's because it's not about plot. It's about character. Right. All of it. The All whole book of it. is character. Yes. I want to talk about, just briefly, uh, about the fact that um, Lisa does so much careful research about culture oh, yeah. that is, in yeah. this book. It's really And fun. in general, right? She's really, she, she loves to put her, she loves to... Um, she loves to set heroes' pasts in in obscure places. Not yeah. that Wales is obscure, but like Reese is Welsh, right? And um, there's so much about Welsh custom and tradition in this book that is really interesting. And um, there's the moment where he talks right at the very beginning. He says he talks about the Othing Stone, right? Yes, the, the right. marriage tradition in in Wales, and it comes back at the end when they marry, but. Um, that's a real, yeah. it's a, it's a real Clapis fingerprint. These mm-hmm. like, these little wedding traditions that are from all these kind of corners of, of, uh, the UK. Um, but there is a moment and I can't pronounce this word, but I'm going to, I'm going to put a TikTok in show notes. There's this moment where she, he, she, he talks about a very specific Welsh word that doesn't have a translation. Um, and he talks about it's like how it's longing. Like yes. it essentially means like a longing for home. Right. And I'm it claw I, I sort of sat with it for a moment because I 
for some reason, Welsh TikTok is on my For You page. Nice. Like, um, which is really very nice. But there is a Welsh woman who I guess, like, that particular word has been, like, co-opted recently by, mm. like, influencers. Like, oh, interesting. American, like, spiritual, like, you know, sage your office influencers. And there's a Welsh woman who talks specifically about that word in Welsh and in Wales and why it is particularly Welsh, like how yeah. it is like built into this sense of like in Wales as independent and the Welsh nationality and Wales as a language mm-hmm. or Welsh as a language, like the kind of identity as an ethnicity. of being Welsh, yes. right? Eth- yes. And, um, we know, obviously, because history, that, you know, Wales and, and England, it's not always great. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of fraught stuff there. But at no, and it is so, it would have been so easy for Lisa to be like, he's Welsh. He says, yes. you know, he says, these seven, he says these seven Welsh words. And like, that. so that's all you need to know. He's Welsh. But she so clearly yeah. did the research there to, like, honor that very particular and, like, kind of obscure thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, of course, Albion as the yes. villain. Right. <sighs> yeah. I um, mean, I So think- I just want to – I want to nod, nod to that because I think you don't often see it. And it's it's such a historical thing. For a book that feels very contemporary. Yeah, it's historical romance with the history, right? Yeah. yeah, I really love that, right? Like, he really does feel like a man from a certain place, right? And he knows what that is and is proud of it, but at the same time expresses, right, his mother's sort of teachings about never let them hear you speak Welsh and, right? Like, there's all these, and, you know, how much he, like, admires his mother but doesn't really want any part of her. Like, there was no love from her. And I, I it is. It's really, I, I, yeah, I find a lot of that stuff really charming. I feel like we should talk about the end because it's yeah. the best, yeah. <laughs> right? Which is. I mean, the last hundred pages of this book fly by. Oh yeah, right. The third act is a really solid third act. It's a bar- it's a barn burner, right? Mm-hmm. So Helen realizes that, you know, and again, romance reasons kind of coincidence, right? Like his best friend that he was going to learn and not right, not you know, appreciate his wife had committed suicide after his wife died in childbirth, and the child was not hit, was not his friends, right? It was Albion Vance's. So the child gets swept away to the orphanage, and Helen realizes that this is her half-sister, and she has to go get her. This is someone she can save. And, um, you know, Lady Barrack is very explicit with her. You, you cannot save this child, but you, using his money, can save... Hundreds of thousands, right? I mean, it's this really uh, very romancy kind of, you know, one versus the many. And Helen's like, doesn't matter. It's this one. I got to go get her. And she and Garrett go down. It's this great scene. And, you know, her sisters, everyone helps her. And then she's like, this will mean the end of my relationship with Reese. He can never be with right. one of Albion Vance's daughters, let alone two. And Albion Vance at this point is going to blackmail Helen, right? Like, you are going to be my entry point into the my sworn enemy's great fortune. And she's like, I can't do that. I think, you know, that's another part, right? Like, she's like, I would have maybe just gone along with it, but I cannot betray Reese to Albion Vance. Maybe I could have lied to him, but I cannot do that. Mm-hmm. And so... She's like, I'm going to go to the train station, and I'm going to go back to Hempstead and kind of get myself together, and we'll probably have to move to France, and everyone will just think this is my daughter and, you know, whatever. Because they look identical. Of course. Romance. Romance. I love it. It's my favorite. That's my favorite microtrope. Oh, yeah. How do we prove you're related? Because they obviously look identical. Of course. That's how it works. And this child even recognized it, right? Oh, the child walks out of her, like, gross room and is like, Mom? Mom? (laughs) Mama? (laughs) Helen? I love it. And so they, um, she's at the train station and, you know, waiting for her train and... 
a nice old man is like, why don't you come sit in the back? It's going to be a while. Your train's delayed. And it turns out all of that was like, and meanwhile, it's interesting to me. This is all Helen's point of view. We don't, Reese's point of view for this kind of whole stretch is gone because it has to be. And um, Ethan Ransom shows up. Does it have to be though? Because the yeah. one thing I really wanted was, of, yes. I mean, I tore, I've, I mean, I tore through this. I thing know. Because it's great. Yeah. But I wanted I McGreeve want brain. I, I wanted the moment. I mean, too. Where Ransom is like, sir. Sir. Don't freak out. <laughs> but today she went down. <laughs> To the East End slums and, and picked like, up a kid. Collected an orphan. <laughs> yeah. It but seems fine. Don't freak out. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, I will admit, I kind of wanted that too. Maybe we could talk about I why mean, it's not there. Like, yeah. maybe we could have Lisa on and just be like, could okay, you maybe. Could just you just write, like, a, like write it up for us like, and put it in AO3? <laughs> yeah. Um, I will admit that if there's anything I wanted from this ending, it's this. But. So Ethan Ransom then, essentially, she realizes she's trapped. Like, they've lied to her. And so he traps her in the room with this child, and then Winterborn arrives. And she thinks it's going to be Albion. Yes. Right. She thinks it's going to be Albion, and she's going to have to face off and, like, kind of try and steal her child. Like, steal, you know, charity away. How's she going to keep the child? Right. And Winterborn pulls her out of the room. I don't even think Mm -hmm. looks at charity. Again, I only have eyes for Helen. And it's basically like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> so, okay, everybody, this is where it happens. Yes. This the is the thing. moment everybody's been waiting for. Yeah. Yeah. Where she's like, finally tells him the whole story. I'm go to France. Yeah. And he's like, try it. Try it. Try it. Not five fucking minutes and I will find you. <sighs> Oh, wait, I'm going to read it because it's so good. <laughs> Hang on. I marked it. And it's all in one page. Oh, yeah. It's literally like, you guys, you've all been quoting. You've been quoting each one of these sentences individually. <laughs> but it's literally like the one page. last yeah. paragraph of one page. Because remember, all and along. I wrote, wow. <laughs> at this moment, all along, we realized she was deluded to ever think that Reese Winterborn would give her up for a second. Right? Right. I mean, there is a moment at the top of the page that's really beautiful where yeah. Helen says, like, losing you felt like dying. Yeah. And so I just couldn't right. I couldn't not lie to you. Like, I, I had to have every moment of you yeah. that I could get. And yeah. it's emotional and lovely. It is. And then he says, try to leave me and see what happens. Go to France. Go anywhere and see how long it takes for me to reach you. Not five fucking minutes. I don't give a damn if your father is the devil himself. I'd let you stab a knife in my heart if it pleased you. And I'd lie there loving you until my last breath. Listen, I'm sorry. That's fucking perfect. Uh, An absolute king. Yeah. Right? And then he is... He is the son. When she wants to continue sort of like, like litigating this... He's basically First like, of all, what the hell, Helen? I've had more feelings. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. That is a great fucking line. Yes. I also underlined I'm sure that you line. did. Of course because you did. Because it's great. It's like the perfect line. Yes. Wait, where am I? Here it is. <laughs> I've had more feelings in the past half hour than I have had in my entire life, and I'm at my limit. <laughs> Listen. You know what else he says? Wait, I want to say one more thing. I probably underlined it. She's like, you don't want to live with two of Albion Vance's daughters, right? And he says, every part of you was made to be loved by me. And I'm, I mean, look, I'm sorry. Game over. Now you know why people fucking love this book. I mean, because right? he's great. Yeah, and then a- he turns around and threatens to kill Albion Vance. <laughs> <laughs> right? He goes right Wait, from... then we get to really the money for me. Of course. Because I've been waiting. I've been patient. It, we're 380 pages in. And I'm like, when is somebody going to get the their clock, their clock cleaned? Yeah. So he goes right from every part of you was made to be loved by me. And then he describes to... in, in intricate detail how you would field dress yes. a sheep in yes. a butcher shop. And then he says, if you don't fucking leave England, yeah. you fucking asshole, 
I am going to field dress you like a sheep in a butcher shop. And the guy's like, oh, shit. And honestly, I assume he leaves. As he should. We never because, hear from him again. And it's great, and he sounds absolutely unhinged. <clears throat> yes. And I'm like, come yes. to me. <laughs> this is when you really. This is, <laughs> this, this is worth the price of admission. <laughs> I mean, it really. Well, and so I, I will admit that I re-listened and reread the whole thing to prepare. But when I just like like fly into this book for comfort, it is pretty much from like the train station on. Mm. Right. Sometimes I go backward to her getting I think charity. I would go to the orphanage. Yeah, then right. Then like the orphanage on. Right. But yeah, like that part where he is just. I would probably. Yeah. I also would read the very beginning again. Oh, yeah. That mean, beginning is really nice. Like that oh, yeah. sort of. Uh, look, how oh, many beginnings start that way? I also really love the scene where she gets a migraine at Winterbournes. And oh, yeah. Garrett Gibson gives her neurologic powders. Yeah, and she it. gets like high on them and tells him that she wants her trousseau to be to, to be a ra- like a rainbow dress and unicorn shoes. <laughs> and he's like, whatever you, whatever you want. Cool. Maybe we should postpone then. <laughs> to the modiste because I love it all. I love, I love it all. Here's what I will say, and I said this to you before, and I'll just like say yeah. it here now too to have it on the record. But I thought a lot while I was reading about the reading this about the fact that Lisa, prior to this series, yeah, had written contemporaries for sure. a significant length of time. Yeah, right. She like took a break after the Hathaway series and wrote you know, a number of contemporaries. And I feel like this book has a lot of that in it. These kind of, and I think the softness of it, I mean, for lack of a better word, like the comfort of it, the fact that that it's not like he is not like knifing people in the darkness, right? Right. Like that, a lot of that stuff feels like over the course of her contemporary books, she found this new kind of elevated Kleypas voice. Right. Right. Yeah. I think so. I think that's a very, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting observation. Like how Like does, the years of right. learning how to write contemporary, contemporary made her, made this book. And this series. I mean, I'm going to trust that you yeah. know this, that, that has made this book and series a little more grounded in reality mm-hmm. than say like now Cravens is rubble and right. you know right, right. <sighs> you know Man. or you know your half brother is mad with syphilis and <laughs> sure. shooting like holding a gun on you <laughs> like all of that sort of wacky stuff is, right like the it's interesting because the the plot drama from earlier books was people driven Mm. And the plot dramas here were are like purely external, right? The train to crashes, move the, the to right turn yes. the page, right to move the right. page along. Yeah, I mean, and it's so. I mean, she's just she's so good at the job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, listen. At some point in the next month or six weeks, we will do our like best of twenty twenty two. And I joked around with Kate in a text, and I said, I really feel like what we should do is do like the best of. 2017 because sometimes it takes a long time to really know what your true favorites are Mm -hmm. and this book to me is a very good example of that like the first time I read it I liked it a lot well I DNF'd it the first time I read it straight through I liked it I have come to love this book over time Right. To like really deeply like know it and love it and see things in it that the first time around I just like didn't notice or see. And I feel like that is the case. Like when when we talk about our keeper shelves, right, like as as romance readers, I don't know what is going to be on my keeper shelf until it reveals itself to me. Right. And sometimes that is years later. Right, I go back and read something again, or I find myself really drawn back to a book that I read over and over again. Sometimes I do know right away, um, but I really do think that that's like the other thing that's really interesting about this book is I have come to love it more over time. I have come to find it deeply comforting over time in ways that like the first time I read it, I liked it a lot, but I didn't like love it, right? 
And now I love it. And the same is true of many authors where I'm like, oh, yeah, I really like that book. And then a year or two later, I'd be like, no, that one is actually my favorite. Uh So I do think that's like another thing that's just really interesting about like our two experiences of this book is the difference between finishing it today and, you know, having had this experience of like really having it be like in the ether of my romance brain for a long time and continually bubbling up for whatever reason. Right? Yeah. And that's I mean, unpredictable. Absolutely. And I look forward to this book aging for yes, me. Yes. Right. Yeah. I think, and I do think that there's so much in here. You're, you, the way that you framed that was exactly right. I mean, this is a real nuanced book in a way that, like, it's different. It's yes. like you see Lisa. At least it's doing a different thing in this book. Yes. Yeah. And so it was actually, I just want to say to everybody out there who was like, oh, Sarah's house and Red yeah. Winterborn. Oh my God. Oh my God. Like, I'm so glad that like if I had to, if I had to like do yeah. it, right? Or I mean, had to do it. Like <laughs> when, when I finally got to this book, like I was doing it on the heels of like so much excitement right. about this book because I think it made me really like sit with it in a different way. Well, and I, I find myself thinking a lot about like the collective, like when we collectively sort of adopt a book as being like meaning something. Yeah. I'm often like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Because that's like also a really fascinating process, right. Where it's like a book can get a lot of buzz, but like this book did not have this kind of buzz Before the pandemic. No. And you know, that's the thing that a lot of people have talked about in general in romance. Like, Lord of Scoundrels didn't get a lot of buzz when it first came out. I mean. It takes a time. It sometimes does take a while. Yeah. You know, um, Julia Quinn talks all the time about how it took three or four Bridgertons before people started buying them. Like, it. so it is a kind of, it's a long it's a long game. It's a long view. Yeah. Yeah. And that's interesting because so much of what we do is like kind of like what's new, what you know, like because we're what's just reading right so now? fast. But like when you think about it, like, okay, if I read 150 books this year, whatever number, what are gonna be the ones that really reveal themselves? That have staying, yeah. staying power. Right. Right. It's that thing that we've talked about before about like the difference between something being popular and something being a legacy. Right. right? Like there's a right. Yeah. They're, those are different things. Yeah. Not always, but often they are right. different things. Right. Anyway. So. Jen, thanks for making me break the glass. Break the seal. We have a couple of other, like, I, I guess I would say one other big announcement I we've talked about on social media is we have partnered with the Body Bookworms box. And we were able to pick a book that we just really liked, and it is Adriana Herrera's A Caribbean Heiress in Paris. And oh, it is such a good book. It's such a good book. And I mean, but you know, this is like a really fun subscription box. If you have not checked it out, we will put links in show notes. But if you don't follow us on social media, you might not have seen this. And I believe that it is available for pre sale through the middle of October or until it sells out. So we will put the links for that in show notes, but it's always really fun. It's like a book. We wrote a little note. There's a faded mate sticker. There's some like cool swag in there. So it's like a really fun, if you're looking for um, a really, really cool, fun subscription box, this is the one you should check out. And we got to pick a, um, essentially like a pro- portion of the proceeds go to a, a charity of our choice. And we picked the National Abortion Fund. So you're also gonna like a couple of those you know, some of those proceeds will go towards a really good in- cause and one that is deeply important to us. So helping to keep abortion safe and legal. And for those of you out there who have been asking and don't follow us on Twitter or Instagram, Faded States is back. We are phone banking every Saturday between now and the election. We have some Really, really important campaigns coming up. All campaigns are important, um, but we're going to do our very best to try and get uh, Democrats elected to the House and the Senate this weekend, um, October 1st. We will be phone banking in my home district. Which is so cool. 
I'm very excited, you guys. Please join us. Um, my home representative district, my my house district, is the only red district in New York City. It is a deeply purple district. We can win it. And um, they've asked our help for phone banking. Come phone bank New York City. Who can say what will happen? <laughs> <laughs> but what I can promise you is that Max Rose, who is the candidate here, is a great guy. And um, I personally would be very grateful if you would join us on Saturday from 2 to 4 p.m. Central Time, 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, it's a Zoom. We'll put links in show notes. Check on Twitter or Instagram for more information. Uh, we'll also put a link to Max Rose's campaign so you can learn more about him. He's a veteran. He's a cool dude. And he's running against an absolute loony to him. Yeah. So we have some other really cool Senate races line, lined up. Um, I'm not sure of dates yet, so we're going to just keep it all under wraps. But trust me, you're going to want to stay interested. And if you are afraid of phone banking or nervous about phone banking, I'm just going to promise you it is the most fun you can possibly have phone banking. We make it really fun, really easy, and you will be there together with us on the Zoom. It, it really feels like you're in a room full of people phone banking. So give it a shot. You can come for 15 or 20 minutes or stay for the whole two hours. But we're really excited to be phone banking in Sarah's district this weekend. And thank you to MJoy and to Lucy LaRue for sponsoring the episode this week. Um, as always, it, the best way for you to support us is to support our sponsors. Otherwise, thank you all so much. It would, you know, thanks for giving us more than five fucking minutes. <laughs> Amazing. Not five months, not five weeks, five fucking minutes. That's right. Try it, Jen. Oh, also, do not read Tolstoy if you plan to get married. <laughs> Pro tip. <laughs> well, that was Lisa's tip. <laughs> Pandora and Cassandra have read Tolstoy, and that's why they don't want to get married. Because well, young women don't want to get married after they read Tolstoy. And look, would you? No. I mean, Lady Barrack had you know, a point. A point. Okay. <laughs> have a great one, everybody. Lady we'll see you Barrick phone banking this weekend. <laughs> All right. Bye, friends. <laughs>